I'm Ian Martin. I'm a journalist. I write also books about financial crises and economic disasters, just waiting for the next one. Not going to have long to wait. But we're talking today about um, tech and freedom. I'm delighted we're joined by Jamie Bartlett. Jamie's one of the key writers globally on technology, great books on the dark net, on the people versus tech, uh, all must reads. And some of you will have heard his fantastic smash hit podcast, The Missing Crypto Queen on the BBC. And it's now being made into a film starring uh, Kate Winslet. And now, Jamie, I'm just going to ask you, before we get into tech and freedom, it's a huge subject, I just wanted to ask you to kind of update us on that incredible story, because it is the biggest internet scam in, uh, in, in history. Is there something in there for us to learn about, um, about freedom? Yeah, so the missing crypto queen said, if anyone has invested much in cryptocurrency in this room. I'm sorry for your loss if you have, but it's uh, the biggest scam of all was uh, a woman called Dr. Rudri Natava, who basically sold a fake cryptocurrency to the world. She called it OneCoin. She sold it through multi-level marketing, you know, Avon, Tupperware, Amway, but she never really had a, a true product. But she managed to convince uh, a million people to invest at least four billion euros, maybe 20 billion euros, in a fake cryptocurrency from 175 countries before going on the run on a Ryanair flight, funny enough, from <laughs> no one would have expected it. Ryanair flight, Sophia to Athens in 2017, and she's still on the run today. Um, she just, as of last month, I've been looking for her for four years now. <laughs> Finally, the cavalry's arrived because last month the FBI put her on their top 10 most wanted fugitives list, the first crypto scammer to ever be on it. And yet there is actually some, I think there is something in this because funny enough, the whole crypto world comes from probably one of the only original political philosophies of the last 50 years, sort of crypto anarchy, quite fascinating. It's all about individual freedom guaranteed by mathematics and the rules of physics, using encryption to keep your communication secure, keep your money away from governments because politicians are fickle, man-made rules can't be trusted and they change, but the laws of physics never do. So with this language of freedom and the promise of you know, infinitely increasing value of these coins, she convinced all these people who didn't understand the technology at all to put all their money into it. But people were free to do it. People from small villages in Uganda were free for the first time, really, to invest all their money in a global cryptocurrency. In the UK, they were free to put all of their money in this amazing project, but they weren't free to make a good choice about it because there was no regulation and no one understood it. There was no regulators explaining it. There were no rules about it. So it was a kind of story of extreme freedom that technology gives you. Also the language of freedom that she used to great effect because it was all about, we're gonna liberate you from the world of the big banks, how they inflate away your money. But without the safeguards, people uh, couldn't make f true choice. They couldn't make informed choices about their investments. So. Anyway, we're going to catch her in the next month, I'm sure of it. I know where she is. So, so you do know where she I is? I think I know where she is. Yeah, I think she's on a boat in the Mediterranean. Share this? Or are you on a boat in the Mediterranean. So when you're on holiday in Greece in particular, go into the fancy bars, keep an eye out for her, uh, go and look on the FBI's website to see how she looks. But how, had, how has she disappeared? So how did, she, is, she is free in, 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 in one way. I mean, she's, has she changed her identity? How has she done it? Yeah, she's, uh, she has... Well, she's... She's sort of protected by a certain government. I mean, she's from Bulgaria. Bulgaria is the most corrupt country in the EU. She was protected by Bulgaria for a long time. It's a lot easier to run scams if you essentially have the protection of a government. Um, so she has fake but official passports. So she'll have an officially issued passport, probably from Bulgaria, certainly one from Ukraine, and one from Kyrgyzstan as well. And she travels under a fake name with hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, pr probably on super yachts, like I've said, with a vast amount of plastic surgery, to a body modification. There's another good uh, use for it right there. So she, um, <laughs> so 
She needs to read your book. She shouldn't have done it. <laughs> so, so it is actually surprising with all the surveillance technology that's out there. If you actually look on the top ten most wanted list, Europol and Interpol and. There's a lot of people that can get away with it for a very, very long time if you've got the money. And she had this huge fan base as well. Didn't you? I mean, to r remind people, she filled stadiums, Wembley Arena, yeah. huge conferences in, yeah, she in Dubai. Th th I mean, you, a million investors, and she'd, she'd speak at arenas with thousands of people. Talk, and she, she sort of embodied the idea that technology could make anything possible. So she would say, but this technology is going to change the world. You don't need to worry about the details. You don't need to worry about the specifics. Just trust me. I am the crypto queen. Forget the tech. It's too complicated. It's for nerds and for geeks. But funnily enough, what she did was to buy sponsored content in a lot of quite sort of legitimate outlets, like Forbes magazine, where she bought sponsored content that she made look like a front cover, ripped off the real front cover, sent it around the world and said, just trust Forbes magazine. I'm on the front cover. Don't worry about the tech. And if anyone said, but how can you create money from just nothing? How's that going to work? I don't understand it. She'd say, but technology can do anything. I mean, look at the magic of Silicon Valley. So yeah. she used the sort of language of freedom and the, belief, the magical power, the belief that we have in what tech can do basically to fool a lot of people. Great, so I mean, th that brings us on to the absolute heart of it, and we're gonna talk for sort of 15, 20 minutes. This is a, sh a short session, and then there'll be time for a, for a couple of questions. But the question then is, does tech set us free? I mean, on, on one level, I was talking to, I talked to several people here um, this weekend who run small businesses, or some big businesses actually, by working from anywhere remotely, things that are, it were inconceivable 30 yeah. years ago are now possible. So on, on that level, it's liberated a lot of people. But generally, does it set us free? Well, I think with that question, there, there's so many different spheres of freedom that, and so many different types of technology. So we, we, we talk about sort of advances in medical science that's driven by artificial intelligence and the freedoms that does give and will give people. When we talk about tech setting us free, we're usually talking about, I think, big technology companies, social media, digital platforms, and our representative democracies that we run today. And that's really, to me, the essence of the question. You've got to narrow it down slightly. And on that front, let me just ask someone in China whether they think technology and digital platforms is really setting them free, in, in a way that we really believed that it would in the 90s. I remember Bill Clinton giving a speech where he said, you know, good luck trying to regulate the internet to the Chinese government. It's like nailing jelly to the wall. And it's like, well, actually, you can nail jelly to the wall, I suppose, with enough nails or something. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it was, the, the, to me, the question is, that, that, or the problem is, that there is a, a fundamental mismatch between representative democracies as we have set them up over the last several decades and the way modern digital technology works. I don't blame big tech for that. It's just that we, on so many levels, so many things that make representative democracies work, and which I still think is the, the least bad form of government, um, require certain institutions around them to actually function properly. The norms and conventions, the strong civil society, the good local newspapers, all of these things that keep the system running, bubbling along, those things are being slowly chipped away by the logic and the economics of technology at the moment. It also comes down, though, I think, to, to individuals' uh, confidence in representative democracies. Give you an example. Who here, well, you'll all remember what it was like. Well, actually, some of you aren't going to remember. But so let me tell you what it used to be like to get a photo developed. It took about, not only did it cost like five pounds to get 25 rubbish photos that couldn't be filtered, couldn't be retaken, <coughs> couldn't be shared with anyone. Well, we expected that. Yeah. That was, and going into a pharmacy to get photos developed was kind of how representative democracies worked. They were in tune with each other. They were slow. They were imperfect. You compromise. Maybe one out of twenty would work for you. Yeah. Modern technology means that doesn't. We, obviously, we don't do that anymore. Everything is instant, immediate. We give total feedback. We can filter it as we wish. We can share it with anyone. We want feedback from everybody about how it works. Total control as a consumer. As a citizen, we are still, our democracy is still in the age of the, of the pharmacy-developed photograph. 
And I think it's gonna, it is and will continue to fuel frustration. For people 20, 30 years from now who've grown up with this, it will seem ludicrous the way they get to choose governments. It's not enough. It's nowhere near enough choice or control. On, I could go into so many specifics, but that's the fundamental of it. So you, they just don't work well together. So you, you'd see people voting more often or being asked, you know, kind of Swiss style, lots of different, different questions I mean, did, on their phones or how, how the hell does it work? Well, I don't really, I, I, I spend quite a lot of time investigating digital, like direct digital democracy, which I think is a complete catastrophe as well. And that is partly because just the way we are socialized into democracy, it will be a very hard shift to suddenly go to everyone constantly voting on their phones over every issue. Yeah. D disastrous in many ways as well. But we've got to do something. And there are certain things I think we could quite easily do. I've never understood why when we get the great gathering once every four years, five years, when we vote, we still get one tick of a box where all we get to choose is, you know, one tick. What do we think about every party's manifesto? What do we think about the opposition? What do we think about the last four years? What do we think about the next four years? One tick. It's ridiculous. So we've got to come up with, I think, better ways to try to gather public opinion at those key voting moments. There are so many other things as well. I mean, I think if you imagine that the basics of a representative democracy depends on a, a certain type of citizen, an informed, literate, thoughtful, considered, sort of this is the, the ideal citizen that makes a democracy work quite well. We've got to work out how to create those citizens, if you like, in an age of total information, of in absolute information overload, of being bombarded by industrial, like, powered personalization machines, which are advertising companies. It's extremely difficult, but I don't think we're anywhere near getting there. So I'd, I'd rather work out how we can improve the mechanisms of representative democracies before we jack it in and go for this, everyone gets to vote on their phones. Yeah, but how's, how is it changing as principally social media? You've talked about it in terms of seamlessness versus friction, but what we, what's been created is a kind of economy where you just think that everything should feel seamless and smooth in the way that you described on pictures, the difference between your pictures getting developed and only one out of 20 working and then Instagram um, working. I mean, it's, a, it's, does that explain the anger that people feel? Because if something is supposed to be seamless and then someone pops up saying this doesn't work or there's an obstacle, you're being reminded that really life does involve friction. Yeah. Life is complex and nuanced and very, very difficult. So people are being sold something which is kind of a myth of freedom. Yeah, we've got to, we got to, uh, re reintroduce friction into our system somehow because the logic of, technology is to make everything as seamless and as easy as possible. Uh, not everything is good when it's really, really simple. I think we have to try to re, if we want to reintroduce complexity and, and be able to ponder ideas deeply and the big social challenges we face, uh, we need to encourage friction and thought and care and consideration over ideas. The problem, obviously, and we, we all know this, I'm not, this is, was fairly an original thought a decade ago, but no longer is, about oh, we get all this information, it's too much, so we just share the things we like and disagree. That's all true to some extent, but I think deeper things are going on here as well. If the medium is the message, as Marshall McLuhan always said, um, think about video content. Video content by nature is much more emotional, I think, than the written word. And more and more of our political choices and how we're informed becomes about anecdotes that we read and see, that we're moved by. I think the shift to video has massive ramifications for how democracy works and how we make choices about it. One of the problems with information overload, I think, is that everyone in society is oppressed relative to another group. And if you go online, you can always find good, solid evidence to demonstrate why that's the case. So everybody ends up screaming at each other, thinking everybody is oppressed by somebody else and it creates this incredible tension and anger. But there are so many other problems here as well. well. I think one of the big things we don't think about is the importance of forgetting. Now, we live in a giant panopticon where I think it's very hard 
for everybody to truly feel free of mind, to have independent thought, because you are constantly worried about how is this going to be received by the grand you know, multitude of millions that are constantly watching. If I say something now that in a decade's time I've changed my mind about, it's going to be thrown back into my face because someone will have screen grabbed it and reminded me of what I thought when I was... I'm so glad that what I thought when I was 18 was not published on social media. I would not be here talking to you. I'd be an outcast. But it's very I difficult... Think, I, I think you should just go now. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the importance of forgetting, the ability to forget, is important when young people especially are forming their political identities. But being viewed by millions of people as you're doing that... Yeah. And knowing it can always be thrown back in your face is a real problem. Uh, I know Hannah Arendt Center is involved in, in this as well. And she wrote really well about everything, obviously, but, but also about the sense in the 1930s that everyone, so ordinary people started to believe that those in power were hypocrites. They would say one thing in public but think another thing in private. Uh, that the problem when everything is recorded is everyone's a hypocrite because everyone changes their mind, apart from the dogmatic politicians who then suddenly become authentic. But it just means that everyone becomes a hypocrite. There's constantly stories about you said this here and I found a screen grab of 2015 when you said that. And it creates the impression that no one up there can really be trusted because they're all just liars because they say one thing in private and one thing in public. And Hannah Arendt said that's a really dangerous place to be because then why would you ever listen to anyone in any position of authority about anything they, none of them can be trusted? So when we focus on the problems of social media and democracy, and it's always about you just see what you want to see and share it with your friends, I think that's a really surface level problem. I think underneath that, <coughs> changing to video, the constant availability of historical data, they're also really important problems that we're not grappling with. It's a brilliant point about the, the, the freedom to forget. I also wonder, as kind of an old school media person raised working in newspapers, if you think about the difference between what you describe and writing a letter to a newspaper for publication, the process you had to go through 20, 30 years ago, you had to be annoyed by what you read in the newspaper, you then had to go to your little desk, take out your piece of, piece of paper, write the letter, and then think, no, that sounds a bit mad. I'll tone that down. You then had to put a stamp, walk to the post box, and then think, do I really want this being read by other people? It then went through a kind of elite filter and editing process, and then might hit the, um, hit the mm. newspaper. Now, you can have, if you write something controversial, a controversial column that you write, or I write about politics, you can have, within minutes, thousands of people screaming at you. But I had an experience recently where I wrote something mildly controversial, went to Sweden, turned off my phone, and was really kind of not engaged for three days, and tuned back in in the middle of it, and there was just thousands of people sort of shouting, and I hadn't really realized that this had happened. But actually, had it happened, if I wasn't really aware of it, is, is the answer to a lot of this, and we're doing some of that this weekend, just tuning out, just turning off your phone, and just actually yeah. accepting that a lot of it doesn't matter? Yeah. Yes, but yes, I think it is. But you're, you're freer to publish. So in terms of expanding your freedoms, yes, you're freer to publish quicker. And sort of taking the power away from the big newspaper editors that controlled it before, and which is good in so many ways, except it just comes with other unintended costs that I don't, even, I don't think anyone involved with the development of these technologies ever foresaw. Because maybe because they were so young when they did it all, maybe because they were sort of so enamored with the idea of sort of anti-statism and how technology was going to improve the world, as I was as well when I first started writing on all of this. So your freedom has been, in, your, your sphere of freedom has been increased, but maybe without some of the requisite responsibilities that come with it. One of the, I like to think about uh, turning your phone off and all the rest of it as, a, as a, a duty of a citizen, as much as it is to vote and to belong to a member of a political party, which is what you have to do in this country now if you want to have a vote on who's going to run the country, and to buy the local newspaper and to join the local 
civil society group to create a strong civil society which encourages geographical bonds between people, which is a bulwark against overbearing state power, all those things that good democratic citizens should do. Alongside that is a determined effort to regain the ability to concentrate, to focus, to know where to channel your anger. I don't know if you've noticed, I mean, anger is an extremely important resource in society, but I feel like many of us get as angry about an angry, a silly tweet we disagree with as we do about catastrophic climate change or whatever. And we're unable to sort of pass out the requisite amounts of anger for the right problems because we can't focus on them because we're constantly on sort of, we're turned up to 11 all the time and we can't focus. So the ability to concentrate, think deeply, I think is a skill that you learn like fitness or diet or reading habits. So all of those things, how we encourage those ourselves, but also in schools, is really important. And I'm a hypocrite myself because I will give my daughter a YouTube video to watch when I just can't be bothered, I just can't take it anymore. But the poor two-year-old is watching <laughs> Paw Patrol, and what is that doing to her? Yeah. So I'm not, the, I'm not always the shining example that I should be myself because it's hard work. But to, to think of patience and concentration as a vital resource in a democratic society as much as voting or buying your newspaper is essential. Yeah. Let, uh, let's, if there are any tech optimists in the room or tech investors, um, or let, let me just sort of devil's advocate put the alternative positive case, which is that this tech revolution, we can argue about where it starts, but at every, you could say it starts in the 1860s, 1870s, but at every stage, the major each major development has been driven by a quest for freedom. And it's delivered extraordinary benefits for mankind, runs the theory. And it's certainly, I mean, it is the case that if you chart how it developed, each time freedom is there. Whether it's in the 19, late 30s, 1940s, when von Neumann and other brilliant mathematicians leave Central Europe and Eastern Europe and are swallowed up by the United States, put to work in places like Princeton. What are they working for? They're working to defeat tyranny. Of course, it's ambiguous. They invent the bomb. Um, but it's still, it's, it's a quest for freedom. Also, the creation of the business machine. It's there, literally, in IBM. The sort of first phase of computerization, which is about liberation from the drudgery of filing and the office, an attempt to create an economy where people would do other more interesting things instead. And then Silicon Valley, which is rooted in a kind of hippie-ish optimism, don't want to work for the man, don't want to work for IBM or the US government, I'm going to set up something in my garage which is motivated by a fundamental quest for individual, individualism and freedom. Now, I'm, I don't yeah. necessarily believe that, but that's what a, yeah. that's what a I was going to say what a Peter Thiel would say. Actually, he's now really depressed about technology and thinks that progress has stalled and is annoyed that not everyone's like Peter Thiel. But still, you get my point. There is this technologists, pro-tech people, see it in terms of human freedom. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. And, and the, the Internet's original seed funding, it was an ARPA project for file sharing on academic computers. But who, where, where, where no security was ever built in because no one really thought it was going to be used for much more than sharing computing space so they could do more complicated calculations. And I think many of them were absolutely staggered when academics in the 1970s started slagging each other off on small forums and stuff like that because they just didn't expect people to use this technology in the ways they'd used every other technology in the, in the past. So... Individual freedom may have always been at the heart of these developments, and they often were, and I th but accompanied perhaps by a naivety uh, about how it would be misused in the sense that uh, I genuinely think that Facebook and Twitter in particular were shocked when military intelligence started putting fake information or amplifying certain stories in a way subtly to sort of try to change people's mind in different countries. Yeah. It was so obvious that that was going to happen. They just didn't imagine that anyone would do it, which is rather odd. But is, so, it, is it because they're not, uh, 
lots of them, they're not philosophy graduates or they're not historians. They're highly intelligent. But actually what you're describing there is a sort of basic Hobbes v. Locke, isn't it? It's about whether man um, or woman is innately good or innately bad and needs to be penned but in Hobbes by Hobbes didn't say man systems. and woman were innately bad, just that there'd always be a small group of bad people that had to be controlled. <laughs> so, be controlled. precisely, yeah. So, 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 we, so, I don't know about the philosophies of them or how far they were really nice, but I, I genuinely, I think it all came from uh, a, a true belief in individual freedom and how technology would increase those spheres. And they would see the power of existing media corps and think ordinary people should have the right to speak their mind, not being filtered by, you know, an un a not democratically elected news boss. So, which is fair enough, but I think maybe there was a naivety about what costs would come with that. And suddenly the big tech platforms are now being told well, you're now also responsible for the problems that you've also created. And we're seeing a sort of war be develop between democratically elected yeah. governments and big tech platforms. Which again, essentially makes kind of Nick Clegg the editor of the world, which is yeah. not, a, not a comforting thought yeah. for those who I follow British politics. Nick. Please, Nick, let my <laughs> post stay up. <laughs> now, we've just, we just got time, for, because we're behind, um, we've just got time, I think, for a couple of questions.